People come in and they're like, damn, I wanna be successful, I wanna make money, I wanna get rich. And I'm like, do it to real estate, right? And so people come in, they complicate everything, man. They, they sit back and they're like, you know, I didn't know where I was gonna get money from sometimes, but then I figured out there's always a way. Like even now, man, I have like 160 million. Banks are like looking at our projects and going drone, like these things don't pencil correctly. And I'm like, no, no, yes they do. And I'm happy to educate them, we're re-underwriting stuff and manipulating things to make sure that they're super safe and, and things go right. Ladies and gentlemen, just go buy a house. Like, go buy a house, buy a house, just rent it. That's all you guys gotta do, like, start there. Like people say, where should I get started? Start there, buy a house and rent it and figure it out. You gonna get rich? No. You gonna learn some stuff? Yes. I started with this one thing, guys. One thing, I'm gonna tell you guys, like I have I had to go back to the basics you know, and I'll tell you why I had to go back to the basics. I have all these people, they're like, damn, drone, I wanna build houses. And they complicate it. Ah, they, people damn complicate everything. And um, man, I was just so excited when I was young. Jacked up credit score, tons of bullshit going on, man. 1998, like, listen to this, guys. Like, you know, you guys, come, people come in and they're like, damn, I want to be successful. I want to make money. I want to get rich. And I'm like, do it to real estate, right? And so people come in, they complicate everything, man. They, they sit back and they're like, you know, I didn't know where I was going to get money from sometimes, but then I figured out there's always a way. Like even now, man, I have like 160 million. Banks are like looking at our projects and going, they're going drone. Like these things don't pencil correctly. And I'm like, no, no, yes, they do. And I'm happy to educate them, re-underwriting re, re stuff and manipulating things to make sure that they're super safe and, and things go right, right? So, but people complicate. This is one thing, guys, this one thing. This is how you start, okay? And you may not like it like I did, but it got me started, right? It built my confidence. So before I built the house, you know, I went and bought a rental house and I bought it through owner financing because my credit sucked. And my wife and I, we were dating at the time and we simply just, one day I was living in a trailer. So I had moved back. My intention was, so here's how the whole story goes down, right? So when I was in college, before I, my entrepreneurial stuff went down, I was renting an apartment. I was paying like $800 a month way back when. And I was like, this is stupid. I can't even afford $800 a month, right? So this is before my entrepreneurial journey started. So I found, I had an old pickup truck, an old Chevy truck. And it was a step side, four wheel drive, 1971, I think it was, or 72 Chevy step side. And I used to beat the crap out of that thing because it was just fun to go take that thing out, four wheel drive in it. And uh, I had another car and I said, you know what, I got to sell one of these. And um, I traded that truck for a trailer. The trailer was inf infested with cockroaches. I mean, it was nasty. And, um, and so I traded it, but I was excited. I was like, man, I'm gonna get this trailer. I'm gonna pay $165 in month of rent. And I'm just gonna go, go to school, right? So I buy this trailer. My dad and I got it. We take off all the power. The cockroaches fucking everywhere. I mean, everywhere. And, uh, and it was nasty. And so we redo the whole thing. We bomb it, we bomb it, we bomb it. We get that thing super clean. And, um, and we repanel it, we drywall it, put in uh, new window coverings on it. I spend about, you know, in those day, that day and age, you know, $500, $600 was a lot. And, um, and I don't even know, I, I don't know what I spent, a few hundred dollars so. And so we remodeled the whole entire thing. It was super clean, but it was in this uh, sketchy trailer park. But was it sketchy? I don't know. So, so I landed up going to college. I rent it while I'm away on my hiatus doing that multi-level market. I come back, kick the people out, and I'm like, I'm just going to live in this trailer for a short time because I was living in Texas part-time. And the rent was still like 165 bucks a month. And so I go to college and then I start running concrete and I chain, I put a little chain link fence around the side of the, uh, of the trailer and I chain some trailers to it. And that's how I start my business and I had a little shed in the back. And I had, I mean, I made so much money. I had that little trailer, um, just pouring concrete. And one day my wife and I, um, who was my girlfriend at the time, I said, I want to buy a house, but not for me to live in. I want, to, I want to go in and actually just rent just rent it and have something that I can show that's tangible. So if you guys have ever heard my story, when I went through my multi-level um, multi marketing hiatus, um, I sucked at it for like two and a half, almost three years. Then I finally figured it out and I made some money. I was making about 20 grand a month, which is not a lot of money, but it was a lot of money, especially back in uh, 1995, 96, 97, a lot of money. And so I spent it on dumb stuff like um, a lake house that I... Um, did an owner finance deal. That's what I kind of learned about it. 
And um, I bought it from this guy that owned an insurance, that was an insurance agent and had residual income and he was retiring. And I listened to him about his residual income and what he was doing and, and how he retired and how him and his wife uh, were moving back up north. And so I, I, these little pieces of the puzzle kind of intrigued me with different people, right? Well, I, I lost that house and I had nothing to show for it. I had a, a Harley Davidson um, a Heritage Soft Tail, lost that. I had an office in Pennsylvania, in Allentown, Pennsylvania, Fairfax, Virginia, one in Jacksonville, Florida, one in El Paso, Texas, one in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and one in San Antonio, Texas. And I land up with all these leases going bad because we got shut down by the FTC. So then I had all that, plus I would use Aaron Rents to put furniture in them, plus I would use Best Buy to furnish the uh, the audio system in there, plus I had uh, financed a bunch of chairs and had credit cards with Bank of Boston, Norwest Bank, if you guys remember those days. And I had all this, these credit cards. And so when I went down to zero, all these credit cards went delinquent. All the leases went delinquent. All the house went delinquent. The car, and then I had a, a Range Rover. And ironically enough, I got land up getting rear-ended in San Marcos, Texas, coming home for Christmas that year. And, um, and the truck, is get, the Range Rover gets totaled. A uh, repo man um, picks it up because I was too stupid to file the insurance on it. I don't even know if I had insurance on it. Um, that probably went delinquent, and that's why the, the repo man comes and picks up the Range Rover from the, the junkyard there. So I had all these lines of bad credit, and I have people they come in. They go, "Tom, I can't get started." I'm like, "Why?" They're like, "I don't have money." And I was like, "So who cares?" I you literally had a 460 credit score, 26 lines of bad credit. And the reason I know how many lines I had was because Lexington Long, who I still use today to monitor my credit every single month, um, I hired them and I paid them like $150 a month. And they helped me get all this crap off my credit over the course of a couple of years. And I landed up negotiating, paying stuff down, 50% on the dollar. And um, I had some subsidized and unsubsidized and unsubsidized student loans, paid all that stuff off. And then what ended up happening, guys, is I went and looked for this house. And I just knew there was a way to finance it. And my experience buying my house up in, uh, in uh, Lake Medina when I was in San Antonio, their owner financing, I was like, you know what? What if I just go in? And, uh, and try to find a house that does owner financing. So people limit themselves. They go look at one house. They're like, well, they don't do owner finance and I can't buy it. And I'm like, well, but you look at one house. And I remember um, Jen and I, we, we ran around and we just looked at stuff probably within, I don't even think it was a one mile radius. It was like within blocks of where um, I was living at the time in this trailer park, right? And so I ran around and we just drove up and down the street, every street, every street. And we're looking for for sale signs. And we would call realtors and someone would talk to us, someone wouldn't. One thing that I learned, though, one thing, this, this right here was gold. I learned how to sell. And so my confidence was high. Even when things were bad, finances sucked, and things weren't good, I learned how to sell. And I learned how, my, how to alter my confidence to make people believe that I was more successful than I was at that point in time. And so I was able to jump on the phone. This was in 1998. And I remember picking up the phone, calling all these brokers, and I was overconfident, right? Like overconfident. And... I get a broker on the phone. I remember his name was Michael Spottiswood. Had a heavy accent. I can't even remember if he was, um, um, I, I want to say, he was from, he was European, some sort. He, he was European. Have a real heavy European accent. Nice guy. <laughs> Too nice. So I was like the Antichrist. This guy, I, he calls me and I tell him, I want to put an offer in this house. And so he goes, that's too low. They're not going to take it. And I said, oh, and P.S., by the way, I want to order financing. And so I ended up calling a bunch of people, telling them the exact same thing. It was just this guy, Michael Spottiswood, who was vulnerable enough and just a nice enough guy to put up with my BS. And so he felt like obligated to me. He was a brand new realtor. He, I don't only think he'd maybe done one other prior deal. I think this was like his second deal. And so I'm sitting there like I'm his boss, right? And um, because I was overconfident, I was running sales offices. I was a little, I was a little pissed, had a chip on my shoulder because the FTC had shut us down, knew I was worth more than what I was making at the time. And so I went in and I told him, I said, put in the effing offer, right? And so, or said, or, or go pound sand and I'll get somebody else, you know? And so I told him in so many words. And so he puts in the offer, lo and behold, it comes back and it says, well, the, the, they're not going to take it, but they'll do some, so then we worked out some terms, we negotiated back and forth. Ultimately, they took my offer to about 99% of what I had offered. And I get this rental home. It's right by the train tracks. It's filled with bamboo on the lot and the house, the floors are warped. It had wood floors. It, it, it had flooded at one point in time because it had flood irrigation. And so the floors were all warped and stuff. I didn't know anything about construction. didn't know anything about fix and flips, but I owned this house. And so I land up going in and I, I clean up the house, gut it, 
fix the heating system, the cooling system, clean up all the bamboo, rent a bobcat, clean that thing out, and just get it all back down to dirt. Then I get some gravel, run it down the driveway, and I get some gravel, a different colored gravel, put it in the front yard, don't put any plants in it, but I clean it up, make it look respectful. I still have these warped floors, right? Like I get these guys down there with jacks trying to jack up this warped floor that had flooded at one point in time. And I think I bought the house for like 80 some thousand dollars on owner financing. I think I put like $5,000 down, if that. And I land up, I land up uh, going in and uh, renting the house. And I don't remember, I remember making money on it. I don't remember how much the rent was. Don't remember any of that stuff. It's been so damn long. But I rent this house, right? And then the neighbor next door has this extra lot. And at the time, I still hadn't bought my first commercial building. So I land up, so I tell you guys, like, don't complicate it, guys. Like, there's so many ways for people, even if you don't have money. And, um, and so I land up going in, and I'm pouring concrete using my regular, um, f my regular job, right? Like, it's not a job. I, I own my own little company, and it was tiny at the time. I had just started it, making a little tiny bit of money. But all this debt, man, 100% of my money is going to pay off all this debt just so I can land up feeling like human again because my credit was so jacked up. And so all these people that come in and complicate stuff, I'm going, man, can you just get a little creative? And so I am up trying to buy the lot next door for $10,000, like subdivide the land for this guy that owned the, the, the lot next door. And he worked at Home Depot. And I remember seeing him at Home Depot. And I didn't know this at the time, but I negotiated with me. He kind of hated me because I was cleaning things up. And he thought I was like a rich guy. And I'm like, I ain't rich. I'm freaking broke. I don't have no money. But I wanted to buy his land for like $10,000. So I told him, hey, would, would you sell it to me? And he goes, no, I won't sell it to you. And I said, and I kept bothering him. Every time I saw him, I just befriended him, befriended him, befriended him. And I wanted a road access from the side road behind my house so that I could park work trucks back there, fence off the back, use it to store trucks, and then land up renting the front house because I was outgrowing this little trailer that I was, uh, that I, I had my trailers, uh, I, I was outgrowing the trailer that I lived in because I was tying work trailers to the fence and I just didn't have room for work trucks and stuff. So I land up um, getting, getting him to finally sell me the land. So I go through this whole subdivide process that I knew nothing about, nothing. And I told him, well, we'll subdivide it. And so, man, I was way in over my head. And so it takes us six months to get this subdivide done. And I told him, we'll get it done, we'll get it done. And now he's like a little irritated, I could tell. But I'm like just befriending him and trying to smooth out his emotions. And, um, and, and I, 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 I keep going month after month. And he, I think he thinks I screwed up his lot, right? Like I'm feeling like, damn, I think I screwed up this guy's lot. He's pissed at me, and he doesn't think I'm going to be able to get this thing subdivided. Now he thinks he has this tarnishment with the city. And I was just a young kid. I still, I was like 24, 25 years old. And, um, and so I, 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 I feel like I tarnished his lot. He feels like I tarnished his lot. I'm not willing to admit that. I'm, I'm just going to push through to get this thing done. So lo and behold, I meet this guy. His name is Enrique Grotti. And Enrique um, helps me out with this little subdivide. And he just befriends me. He knows that I'm just a struggling kid trying to figure stuff out. But just like the fact that I was ambitious. And there's a lot of people out there like that. And so fin finally, he uh, showed me the exact process of what I needed to do. It helped me out. We got finally got it done in month number six. So we, we land up getting access to the back. I land up fencing it off. I put all these work trailers back there. The neighbors hate me. Now, we're renting the front house. And now at this time, I'm looking for a second rental home. And so I'm running around. Same thing. We just kind of calling, 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 calling brokers, calling brokers, right? And, um, and so as we're calling the brokers, we finally find a second house. Same exact thing. And so I buy this second house, and I put almost no money into it, just, just fix it up, go in there. I remember renting these sprayers from Home Depot, and um, we, would, we went in there. We cleaned it all up, and I did drywall and metal stud framing when, I was, uh, um, when we first opened up the business, and I was sanding drywall laboring way back when, when I was first in college. So I fixed up all the drywall myself. We painted it ourselves and we were trying to do all the late work all ourselves because that's what you do when you're young and you don't know, you know, you don't know what you're doing. And so we clean it up. We rent it. I make some money, right? So I have these two rental homes and I'm in the game. I'm in the game. I got two assets. I own two homes, right? Very little out of pocket, but I own these two homes. No one taught me this. I didn't buy a, a sub two course or I didn't buy a buy land build house course. I didn't buy any of that stuff. I just bought a couple houses, right? And I learned that after about a year, that tenants were tough and expenses to maintain the home sucked. Um, I had a tree fall on top of my electrical lines one night. It's pouring friggin' rain, just pouring rain, pouring rain. And the middle of the night, two o'clock in the morning, I get a call from the tenant. Phone's blowing up. Phone is blowing up. Now cell phones are finally something, right? Like we got these, uh, these cell phones at a time when 
um, when nobody had them, we'll give you $700 bills a month. My cell phone was blowing up in the middle of the night. And lo and behold, a Chinese amp falls on the, on the electrical line and it rips the entire friggin' panel off the house. Go figure. It, the night that it rains. And so there's electricity running through the water, all through the water on this, at this house. And I get there. They go, no, don't go in there. There's like electricity running through it. That line is live. So we finally called the utility company. They, they shut off the panel. And, um, and I'm sitting back. And this was like my final straw because we had already had a bunch of other issues. And I'm sitting back going, good God, man, like what else could go wrong with these damn houses, right? So I land up um, putting the houses for sale after this. I get it fixed up um, in like the insurance money and stuff. I always had deductibles, didn't know how to really work the system at that point in time. So I was like vulnerable to the circumstances of being naive, right? So I'm learning though. And so I, I land up buying this, uh, I, I buy these two houses and now I put them up for sale. Now at this point in time, I learned something though. I learned, okay, owner financing. Now, I sit back and I go, okay, I need a building. Neighbors hate me. I got to sell this house. I don't want this lot in the back. The other 10000 for this lot that this guy owns, I'm going to sell that. And then I landed up selling that lot. And um, a guy came in and built a little house on it. It was cool. So I got a double whammy takedown. Landed up selling that lot for like something like 30000 Made like 20000 on the back lot. Landed up selling the house for about a $35,000 profit. And then I sold the other house for about a $40,000 profit. So now I made some money. I landed up owner financing a building. I took that money and landed up putting like $60,000 into renovations, putting a new roof on the building, putting a new pocket roof on the front, doing stucco, storm glass on the front doors. So I have those nice commercial grade doors and I landed up renting them. In the back of the building, I store my equipment. And it was a win-win, but I bought it through owner financing the same way you buy single family homes. And it was just an 8,000 square foot building, a super simple, all block. I gutted it because the block was blocked, right? And I landed up with these evaporative coolers on the roofs and it worked. And I landed up making about $7,000 a month in rental income. And I had a little 800 square foot office. And so I turnkey had a business and that took me turnkey about six months. So in the process, I was selling these other homes, buying this building. It's about 2000 now, 2021, I mean, 2001. And now I'm, I'm already building a house. So now I landed up buying a lot. Turning dirt on a house in the middle of all this time in 1999, and I'm, I'm sitting back just trying to figure out ways to make money, guys. I just try to figure out ways to make money. I didn't know how to make money. I, I knew how to do multi-level marketing and stuff, but I didn't know how to make money. I was just trying stuff. But I was trying stuff that I saw other people making money at that I felt I can do. And so I ended up duplicating. This dude rolls up one day. We're pouring a, a slab, a driveway for these customers, and this dude rolls up on a hard Davidson motorcycle. And some of you guys have heard this story. Some of you guys haven't. But this dude rolls up in a Harley Davidson motorcycle, and uh, he's from Austra uh, he's from Australia. It had a real heavy Australian accent. Dude looked cool, man. He had all those the skull rings on and tattoos. Had a cool accent, goatee, bald, and but had a Tommy Bahama shirt buttoned down, looking smooth in the middle of a Wednesday afternoon, like he was getting ready to go to the nightclub. And I'm sitting back, what the fuck does this guy do? You know, so rolling up in a Rolling up in a Harley Davidson motorcycle, middle of the day, just looking smooth as ice, man. Like he's just ready to go out. And um, I'm like thinking, man, that's the job I need right there. And so I go, so I, second day, my guys are there. We happen to show up to check on my guys. Well, he's checking on his house the exact same time. Ironically enough, God works in mysterious ways. And so I go up and I talk to him and, and that was just me, right? Like I wasn't afraid to talk to people because I learned how to sell. I was okay with it. And I just went up to the dude and I go, I go yo, bro, I go, I go, um, I go, this your house that he was building? He goes, yeah. He goes, yeah, mate, it is. And I go, I go, bro, nice house, man. I said, uh, I said, you, uh, this your house? You build it for yourself? He goes, no, it's for a client. And I go, uh, what, what do you think you're going to make on it? And he goes, I reckon I better make at least $80,000, tells me. And I said, shit, you think you're going to make 80 grand on it? And he goes, he goes, I better. And uh, I, go, um, I go, how long do you think it's going to take you to finish the whole house, start to finish? He goes, 120 days. He goes, four months. And I go, how many do you have going on? He goes, ah, six of them. And I'm going, 80 times six. I'm not going, holy shit, man, this guy's crushing it, right? So I'm like, damn. So guess what I do? I go in, owner financing, and I, there's a lot available, three lots over. I, I, I didn't even think about it. I was like, $80,000 profit, three lots over? I'm going to do the same damn shit this guy does. So I'm sitting there on the Kodak cameras. You guys remember those Kodak cameras? Like, you take a picture, and then it has a little roll of it. Take another picture. Take another picture. It's like this little paper Kodak ca uh, cameras, the throwaways. Well, I carry those in my bag because I take pictures of my concrete job. That's how I 
built a portfolio because we didn't have all the fancy websites and all that stuff that we have today. So I have my little Kodak cameras. And I go down to Walmart. I go develop my pictures, stuff them in, to stick them in a picture book. And I walk around when I, when I go sell a job with my little picture book from all my Kodak um, film cameras. And I go sell, show people pictures. This is what I could do. Picture after picture after picture. So I'm going in there poaching pictures of his house. And I'm taking all these pictures of his house. Why? I'm going to copy his house. I'm going to take it. I'm going to take all those pictures to an architect. And I'm going to tell him, hey, can I get this house? Now, I was doing work for this guy named Ron. He was a framer at the time. And there was this guy named um, Tim and Rob Helmick. And I remember these dudes. Um, I remember doing some work on a, 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 a subdivision that they were working on um, called Corrales and Cantata. And I built these concrete walls that look like stone. They're still there today. If you go drive by the subdivision, they still the stone walls are still there today from like, um, from like 2000. And so I remember going to Tim and Ron and I was like, hey, man, I start, I start poaching information from them. And I'm pouring like concrete driveways for them and borders and waterfalls in their spec homes. And these guys are building, but they wouldn't give me the information because I was just a subcontractor. So I'm sitting back trying to poach information from these guys. They wouldn't give, them to, give it to me. Um, but I go in and so I land up buying that lot, owner financing, and I go get a line of credit out on one of the other houses in 99. I still hadn't sold the other one. So now I have this uh, this house that I have an owner financing. I'm going to go in the bank, getting the home equity line of credit out on the house that I bought on owner financing. I landed paying off the owner financing, pulling out an extra hundred thousand dollars on this house that I renovated. That was a rental house. So now not only did it make me rental income, but now my credit was jacked. I remember going and talking to this lady named Joanne. And so I said, "Listen, guys, this is just all creative stuff, right?" So I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I was like, "I got to figure out a way to get enough money to build this house because I couldn't get a construction loan." Because I didn't have no money. My credit still sucked. And I didn't have the capital to do it. I had a little bit of money saved up. And I had sold one of the houses. Had enough money to go in and utilize that to get started. Had saved about maybe $60,000 I had in the bank. Still not enough to make money, uh, to build a house. So I landed up going and talking to this lady named Joanne at a credit union. I told her, hey, Joanne, I want to build this house. And, um, and I said, and she goes, so she runs my credit. And, you know, meanwhile, lo and behold, I had this, this car loan with them. And the car loan went to Lincoln when I went in default in, in 1997. I landed up paying them back. I only owed them like $2,000, but I paid them back. And so she goes, Jerome, I don't know if I can get this loan done. Your credit's so bad. Everything's, I mean, it's just horrible. I go, Joanne, you guys got to help me. She goes, Conrad was the bank president. He was at the credit union president. And this, this credit union was a credit union that my dad had when he worked at the, at the electric company as an accountant. And so it was just a credit union just for the, the public service company, for the electric company locally. And so I couldn't embarrass my dad. My dad would have killed me. He would have sliced my throat, man, kicked me in the ass. And I was like, I was like, Joanne, I was like, you got to help me, man. I've got to get this loan. And I told her my little business plan, sat in a chair, and I remember waiting for her in the lobby, feeling like a dipshit, like we're working this stuff in my head, going, okay, I'm going to tell her this, you know. And then Joanne comes out. She's like, hey, Jerome. I feel like this little boy, this like, goofy little boy, right? I was like 26, six years old, 25 at the time. And I feel like this stupid, goofy little kid. Hey, Joanne, how are you? All gullible, you know? Hey, Joanne, yeah. Yeah, I want to get a loan. I want to build this house. I'm like, like this kid with this big dream. She's just sitting there looking at me thinking, I don't know about this guy, right? And she, she sat there. And I think I was just, just convincing enough that she sat back and she goes, she goes, you know, Jerome, I don't know if I can get this done, but let me talk to Conrad tonight. And I'll call you tomorrow. And so, man, I remember going back. To, I, I remember um, telling telling my girlfriend, who's my wife now, I remember going, man, I got to get this loan, man. Like, I remember thinking about it all night long and just talking, talking in, in sequence to her. She was probably sitting back, yeah, whatever, dude. Like, you're freaking, like, whatever. It was the right, like, whatever. And so, so I land up. So the next day, I'm just like waiting for this call, right? So I couldn't wait long enough. So I call her up. I'm like, Joanne, I was like, you talk to Conrad? And she's like, yeah. She goes, you should probably come in. And I was thinking, oh, man. So I get through all this pre-anticipation. I, I go in, roll into the credit unit, and she goes, she sits me down, right? Conrad comes out, and, I, and I'm like, and he sits on the corner of a desk. Like he, he comes and sits on the corner of the desk like boss man, right? Leg hanging over the top of the desk, and, and, and he's wearing a suit and tie. And I'm sitting there, I'm pouring concrete, so I'm wearing like shorts and flip-flops and a T-shirt, looking like a, like a jackass, going in for trying to get this construction loan, right? And Joanne comes out. And she goes, she comes coming out. She's like, hey, Jerome, how are you? She always had a real smile. She come give me a hug. She's like, okay. She goes, all right, Jerome, we're going to do this for you. And so she started, and then it's like a mother talk. 
And I'm getting like this mother and father talk from Conrad and Joanne. And so I get, I get this, this, this mother father talk from after plea bargaining with them to give me this loan, right? For a hundred thousand dollars. And so, um, so I get the loan and then I land up, uh, I, I, jo- Conrad leaves and Joanne sits back and she goes like that to him. She goes, Jerome, if you don't pay this loan back, I'm going to freaking kill you. I will find you. I know where your parents live. I know where you live. I will find you and I will kill you. She goes like that. She goes, don't let me down. She tells me like that. And I'm like, Joanne, I promise I won't let you down. I promise I won't. And so like, this was like my key. Like this was like my bear of entry. I was like, all right, Jerome, don't fuck this up, man. Like, like, let's go, let's get it, man. Like, let's go. So guess what I did? I left that bank and it game on baby, 120 day build game on. And he was just balls to the wall. Had the lot tied up, had enough money. Now I had like 170,000, but I didn't have enough money. I had like 170,000 between two different loans, an equity line of credits, this $100,000 loan. And, um, and the owner financed it on this deal because I didn't have like a construction loan. So I was able to take like this $30,000 lot. So I had about 200,000, still needed about like 65,000 at the time to finish this house. So what do you do? I fucking pour concrete. I'm like selling jobs. But I was like, okay, I, I got at least two months worth of money to get this bill going. And in two months, I, I'm averaging about maybe fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000 a month in profit. You know, if I, if I work hard enough and I get enough jobs, I build another crew, I can make just enough money. Man, I'm sitting back just pouring concrete, pouring concrete, pouring concrete, building this house, just hoping that I can have enough money in my account for when I run out of money, I have enough money to finish the house. So I'm like pouring, I'm like pouring concrete relentlessly, trying to make enough money to make sure that I have enough money to finish this damn thing. And so I go to work, 120 day build. We finish the house. I'm bouncing checks, man. I'm setting, I'm, I'm paying subs. I'm s- sending out subcontractors checks with no signatures on them. I'm like mailing them with no signatures on them, knowing they didn't have signatures on them. They call, them, hey Jerome, uh, there's no signatures on this check. I'm like, oh shit, sorry, I forget to sign that thing. I'm like, all right. And then I'm like, oh yeah, well, I'll, I'll be, I can't meet you today. I can't meet you tomorrow, but I'll meet you on Saturday, knowing that it bought me a little more time to collect on more concrete jobs. And I deposit the money, write them a second check, and they were cash. I was like, okay, can't burn these bridges, can't burn these bridges. But some of you guys are sitting there waiting for the perfect answer. And I'm sitting back going, damn, what are you guys waiting for? You know? And yeah, I might have been a little bit overly ambitious. Yeah, I might have done some stuff that I did whatever it took to get it going, right? But some, so many of you guys just put a wall up. But you know what got me started? It's those little single family rental homes. Just the creativity of buying those rental homes, that little subdivide that I did, and I took the back lot, and it took me six months. Didn't really have, I like, didn't have a like, monetary value, but I did it, and I got educated, right? Figured out after a year that I hated the single-family rental game, got in a commercial building, landed up liking it. In the interim time while I was going, doing all this, I'm building a house, and I'm learning the process of it, begging for money from banks and different people. And so understand, ladies and gentlemen, that I get it, man. Like, life's hard. I get it. Money's, money's, money's tight. Um, I get that sometimes... Uh, life seems to just come down on you and just seems to make things so damn complicated, but it's really up to you. And I just sit back and I go, man, God's always provided, provided that I was willing to get on my ass and go to work. And the truth of the matter is 99% of you guys will never go through that bullshit. 99% of you guys will never, never, never do what it takes to do it because I just don't know if you don't have it in you. You know, I just, I don't know. All I know is this is that if you just make daily moves to improve your life, whether it's with fitness, with health, with family, it's amazing how when you feel good and you look good and, and, um, and things seem to be better, that life changes, just happens for you. And all of a sudden, what you once thought was never, gonna, was never tangible, all, all of a sudden starts to happen. Um, so anyways, ladies and gentlemen, thanks, Tori. Appreciate you, bro. Thank you, man. Um, so truth be told, man, I could tell that story. You'll hear it in different podcasts and different places in different formats, different ways. You know, I try to put these, these five-year stories condensed into 20, 30 minutes. And it's tough to give you guys the whole thing. I, I can, I remember my wife and I dating and shit, even to this day, she tells me, damn, I never heard that story. And uh, I remember for the first 10 years, she's like, I don't think I've heard a, a story twice. And when you're living, you're living, guys. And when you're not living, you're not living. People that have a lot going on get a lot done. And people that have absolutely nothing going on get nothing done. And the reality is my story sounded like a lie. In fact, so much so that I had so much going on at the time that I remember telling people this and they just look at me like sideways, like, you know, this young kid that's in his twenties, like he's full of shit. Right. And I I would tell my wife, who was my, was my girlfriend at the time, tell her, 
I was like, she's like, I go, I, I can't even tell people my story. It sounds like a friggin' lie. She goes, yeah, but it's not. And I said, I know it just doesn't even like, people just can't comprehend it, man. Like, it's just, they don't even get it, right? Like, what do you do for a living? Oh, I build houses. Oh, well, I own commercial buildings. Oh, well, I, I own a concrete company. Oh, yeah, I still, I'm flying to China and I'm running multi-level marketing companies and taking new skid of farming it into China with Mark Spitz, right? Like, who does that stuff? All at the same time, right? And so it's like, you know, it didn't even seem real. And I'm flying back and forth to Texas. We're, we're, doing, we're building a company called Eileen. We're like double dipping in multi-level marketing companies at the time. I had an office in Albuquerque where we were doing, um, where we were on the news and we were doing all this other stuff with multi-level marketing. I had sales teams still going, all of this stuff. And nobody even knows that we were doing all of that stuff all at the exact same time, all at the exact same time. And PS, by the way, we had coffee shops and juice bars at the time too, because I bought my first building. And I was like, okay, cool. What can I put in them? Coffee, jo- shop, coffee shops and juice bars. And my wife was running a dance school. And so we were running a dance school. We had coffee shops and juice bars. We were building houses. We were, um, we were buying retail buildings and renovating them. We were, um, we were running concrete. I was also doing golf courses and stuff. We were doing like the landscaping. We were doing the greens and stuff on them. We were doing everything and anything to make money and make shit happen, right? But that's what it took. And so ladies and gentlemen, the reason I tell you guys that is not to brag. I tell you guys this is be, because you guys should buy a house. That's why. That, that was my whole thing. When I got on this live, my, the whole reason for this was you guys should buy a house and rent it. And that, that's really the honest to God truth is like, you should buy a house. What's up, Mark? How you doing, bro? Um, yeah, you guys buy a fucking house. Just buy a house. Like, that's what you should do. Like, people like complicated. Like, I buy like, a piece of land, build a house. Yeah, you can buy a land. Buy, buy a land, build a house. I can help you do that. Yes. You'll make a shit ton of money. But shit, if you're scared, just buy a house. Just like buy a house and rent it. That's it. Go find an owner financing and be resilient about it. Drive down the road within a couple blocks of your home and just buy a house. Even if it's a piece of shit, just buy it and rent it and learn about it and make some money on it and just make sure that you check rental comps and just buy the damn house. And that's all we did. We didn't complicate it. We just checked comps. We made sure that we were getting what we felt was a good deal. And um, we were looking at resale value of houses that were nicer, that were that were like for sale and ready, like move in ready for clients. We would look at move in ready homes and we would say, okay, that move in ready house, like if we, if we wanted to move into that house that was like ready to move into, it was worth that much money. But this house is kind of a piece of shit so we'll just take this kind of piece of shit house at this discounted price and put like half of that money into it and we'll just rent it. And we have some equity and if we ever have to sell it, well, we got a little upside and we did. And so when we sold them, we made some money on them, right? It was like a fix and flip, but wasn't. It was really supposed to be a burst strategy that I didn't know what the hell a burst strategy was at that time. I don't know what a burst strategy was until like 2018 or something. And so anyways, that's, that's what you do, ladies and gentlemen. Just go buy a house. Like, go buy a house. Buy a house, just rent it. That's all you guys got to do. Like, start there. Like, people say, where should I get started? Start there. Buy a house and rent it and figure it out. You're going to get rich? No. You're going to learn some stuff? Yes. Uh, you're going to learn some stuff about yourself. You're going to learn some stuff about renting. You're going to learn some stuff about renovations and fix and flipping. Uh, you're going to learn about being a landlord. Um, you're going to learn whether you like it or you dislike it. And there was a lot I didn't like about it, ladies and gentlemen. But then somehow, I just kept landing up back in it, right? And I landed up liking commercial rentals more. That's how I landed up going in and scaling retail. Cause I was like, damn, retail customers are good. Like I can rent to them. They own their business in here. They pay the rent. Um, if I call them, they don't dodge me. They're not a pain in the ass. And I make them responsible for everything. Air conditioners, everything. Windows, locks, everything. So when a toilet gets clogged, they don't call me. If they do call me, I say, yep, here's your lease. It's your responsibility. So I like commercial leasing because it was a triple net lease. They took care of absolutely everything on the building. And they, except for the roof, which was new, and the landscaping on the outside, which they actually land up paying common area fees. And since we had crew guys, they go in and blow the property once a week, clean it up. And I charged them charge of money. So I actually made money off of them to clean up the property for them weekly on what's called common area fees, cam fees. And um, I liked commercial. And that's why I scaled into commercial. And that's how we acquired over a million square feet of retail. And we still own most of that today. We've sold a lot of it, um, but we still, all the good properties we've kept and we still own them today. And, um, and then we've evolved and that's how we got into multifamily. But this was an evolution of experience, time, market changes, market conditions. And I'll tell you guys right now, there's a lot of like multifamily people. They're going to get bloodied up right now. And I hate it. I hate even saying that, man, if you guys only knew on the back end, like I, I got to record some of this stuff, um, 
if you guys even knew what I was going through right now in the back end with financing on these on our multifamily deals, you guys would sit back and go, no fucking way. Why would you like even go put yourself through this agony, Jerome, with as much money as you're worth? And I'm like, because I just know what five years looks like. I know what five years from now looks like. So I'm sitting back going, as much of a freaking pain in the ass the banks are to us right now with all our experience, all of our net worth, everything that we have, all of our strategic partners, in spite of that stuff, the banks are a friggin' pain in the ass right now to everybody. But once we get them done, which we are, and we're right, right there on over $160 million worth of assets, and we're like right there on three big builds, and we're like about to turn key on these things, and we're going to be walking a tightrope on these things budget-wise, timing, management, the stress that it's going to take to put these things in alignment in the right time frame. It's a right, it's a right amount of time. It's going to take, um, it's going to take the, right, the right management, everything. It's going to take absolutely everything to make sure that these, these projects run smooth. And so is it temperature taking? Yeah, it's temperature taking, right? Like, I mean, but that's the reality. But it isn't anything that we haven't done in the past. And so I always tell people, like, here's my whole thing, guys. And if you guys can get to this point in your life, you will mass fortunes. And I tell my wife, I tell her, I go, I just pray to God every night. I say, God, just keep me healthy. Because I always tell myself, they're by the grace of God. And I thank you, God, for making me me. Because I'm unique. I am. I'm unique. And I say, God, thank you for making me me. But God, please just give me health. Like just keep keep blessing me with health. And as long as you bless me with health, Lord, I will do everything I can to make sure everything's good. Because there's one thing I know about myself is that if I got to manage these freaking projects, if I got to put on a hard hat and make these things work, no matter what I have to do, no matter what I have to do, I'll get it done. And I will manage them correctly. I will get all my investors, all their money back because I always have. And I always freaking will. And there's not like it's not an option. And so I just say, God, just keep me healthy. Because as long as God, God makes me healthy, there's one thing I'm not afraid of. And that's hard ass work. And most people, most of you guys, you suck because you guys are afraid of hard work. You guys don't want to work hard. You guys want to get rich. But you want to work hard. I'm like, well, man, I'm worth hundreds of millions of dollars. And I don't feel that way because I still freaking work hard. Because banking, unfortunately, changed. And as wealthy as we are, if I want to continue going forward and keeping the business moving for my kids, I have to do untraditional bullshit to make things go on under unprecedented times, which we're living right now. We didn't know we were going to go from a 3% cap rate to a friggin' 7% cap rate in like a year and a half. Like that's on friggin' foreseen. Like it's on, like no one, no one friggin' plans for that bullshit, right? Like it just happens. It happened fast, guys. It turned our values from like, you know, we had a value of like $70 million to like $40 million overnight. And it's like, okay, how do you tell about, hey, give me a $50 million loan for a $40 million asset, right? It's going to be worth $70 million though. Fingers crossed, right? Like, how do you do that? So you figure it out, you budget it, man. Like you, you change, you migrate. And that's the world and the environment that we live in right now. So when you guys sit back and you guys go, oh yeah, well, this guy's already rich. Yes, I am. But you know what? I am more than rich is I'm wise. And I'm a hard fucking worker and I will figure shit out and I am resilient because I bought a house because I bought a house. That's why. Cause I bought a house. I bought a house that I renovated and I bought a house that almost electrocuted the whole damn neighborhood one night when the tree fell on the electrical box. And I bought a house that I, that I took out owner financing on. And I bought a house that I took out a home equity line of credit on. And I bought a house, that same house that got me a line of credit to go build another house. And while I was doing that, I bought a retail center, an owner financing, and I bought a building. And all of this was just little bits of experience, building armor and resilience, the skin of a rhino. You guys know why, why I keep these rhinos around? I'm going to tell you this. You guys want to know why I keep these rhinos around? This is a, a success rhino because rhino skin is over two inches thick. And back in the days when there wasn't steel on this earth, Soldiers would use rhino skin as shields against their enemies because their skin was so thick. So rhinos, they're vegetarians. So on the outside, you look like a calm, cool, collective, cool guy. But you see this horn? They're vegetarians, guys. They're not carnivores. They don't fight other animals. But if another animal messes with them, they'll shove that horn right up their ass. Because they, they, you don't fuck with a rhino, okay? Truth be told, right? That's why that horn is there. It's a badass animal. And the little things in life, mosquitoes, flies, 
two inch thick skin, the little things in life, they don't bother this animal. Rhino skin. Ladies and gentlemen, I bought a house. I bought a house. Ladies and gentlemen, God bless you guys. Good night. Go buy a house. That's what you need to do. Go buy a house. God bless you. Good night. Go out in the compound. Your success.